Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Paul Pope. I'm going to be um, partially hosting this today. I'm going to introduce a Brumley fellow to do the actual hosting. Um, I'm a professor of practice uh, at the LBJ School and a senior fellow in the Intelligent Studies Project. Um, I want to thank the, the Strauss Center for, for funding both the Brumley Fellows and, uh, and the uh, Intelligent Studies Project. Um, and I also want to give a shout out to the Brumleys themselves who make this fantastic program work with their, with their financial support. Nobody asked me to do that, but I think it's important. Um, and uh, my job today is to introduce my mentee, uh, Marini Kirsch Schwartz, who many of you know. Um, she is a Next Generation Graduate Fellow uh, in the Brumley program. And, uh, you know, all, of, all the Brumleys have a, a distinguished scholar assigned to them as a mentor, except Marini. She has, she has me, um, but everybody else has, a, <laughs> has an actual distinguished scholar. But anyway, it's, it's great to be able to work with, uh, with these young people. And, and one of the things I always try to do when I'm, when I'm teaching a graduate seminar is to learn a lot about the students because they bring so much to the seminar. And Marini is herself an expert on a number of counterterrorism issues and biological nonproliferation and a number of other things. So anyway, I'm honored to be her mentor and I'm honored to introduce her to introduce our distinguished speaker, Ambassador Bonnie Jenkins. Thank you, Marini. Thank you so much, Professor Pope, although I would push back at your comments, comment on being a distinguished fellow. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Ambassador Bonnie Jenkins. Ambassador Bonnie Jenkins is currently the chair of the steering committee of the International Women's Conference on preventing the proliferation of WMD to non-state actors and the chair of the Committee on Radioactive Sources. She is also an adjunct professor at Georgetown's University um, School of Foreign Service and a lecturer at the George Washington Elliott School of International Affairs. She is the founder and president of the organization Women of Color Advancing Peace, Security, and Conflict Transformation. Ambassador Jenkins has held numerous positions in government. From 2009 to 2017, she was an ambassador at the U.S. Department of State, where she served as coordinator for threat reduction programs in the Bureau of International Security and Nonproliferation. She also served on the team that helped establish and launch the Global Health Security Agenda in 2014, which is a global effort that has helped build country capabilities to respond to infectious diseases like Ebola, Zika, and now COVID-19. Ambassador Jenkins is a retired Naval Reserves officer. She holds a PhD in international relations from the University of Virginia, an LLM in international and comparative law from Georgetown, an MPA from the State University of New York at Albany, and a JD from Albany Law School, and a BA from Amherst College. I'd also like to take this time to welcome Ambassador Jenkins back to UT as she taught a seminar here in 2018. Ambassador Jenkins, over to you. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. And thanks for inviting me here to, uh, to have this conversation with all of you. Um, I've been asked to uh, say a few words about really the status of arms control, nonproliferation today, uh, the geopolitics, and thinking about what may change in the future. Will the elections change anything? Um, and so I thought about this vast area, um, and I decided to just talk a little bit about the different type of what we're actually talking about in terms of the treaties that exist and what have been some of the challenges and to explain why this is such an important question right now at a time when there really is a lot of question about where we are in terms of arms control and nonproliferation and what does the future look like. Um, so I do want to thank uh, all of you for giving me a chance to talk about this. Um, and it's also, of course, wonderful to be uh, reconnected with, with, uh, with the school. So I'm gonna share my screen. And what I'd like to do is, since I know everyone gets tired of PowerPoint slides at some point, I'd uh, love to have questions, uh, if anyone has questions during the actual discussion, because I see this as a discussion. So um, if you have questions when I'm going through some of these, please, um, please feel free to ask them. So, what is the status of the of, of uh, arms control treaties and the regime? Um, well, as I said, for, for those of us who work in the field of arms control nonproliferation, you know, there's a lot of questions right now just about that that issue. Um, we have been seeing that the U.S. has been withdrawing from a number of treaties and conventions, which I'll go through. Um, there's been a fear of a new nuclear arms race. 
Um, there's loss of uh, loss of platforms for negotiations with the Russians um, because we lost the uh, international the intermediate nuclear forces treaty, which I'll talk about. But now we're also uh, maybe forcing facing uh, no no new start treaty, which I'll talk about. Um, we've had some challenges with our allies. Uh, some of our, our strongest partners on these treaties for many, many years. Um, there's a challenge of what is the role of China in these treaties. And then there's challenges to biosecurity and bio and chemical uh, weapons issues. So I'm going to quickly go through these. I'm going to spend just a few minutes, a couple of minutes or, or just on each one of these, because I wanted to just give you the lay of the land and why this, why this issue of what is the future a kind of a scary one for those of us who work on these issues, because each one of these treaties that you see in front of you is actually being challenged in one way or the other. Um, and this really makes up the arms control non-proliferation regime. So first, uh, nuclear weapons treaty, which most of you are probably aware of, particularly since President Johnson was uh, the president who signed the treaty back when it was negotiated in the 1970s. Um, and for those of you who are not as familiar with it, the treaty really is uh, the effort to try to prevent states from nuclear weapons and, to, and for those who had them at the time, which was US, UK, China, Russia, and France, to, dis, to get rid of their weapons. Of course, since the 1970s, we've seen other countries develop nuclear weapons. So there's essentially eight in total now. But this, this treaty still remains important, still stands firm. There's been questions about it. The main question that exists with this treaty is in Article 6, for those of you who are not familiar with it. Um, this article is the one that basically says that countries will work together for complete disarmament uh, uh, as they are committed to. In this. this has been an issue of concern for the obvious reason. We still have new weapons. Um, and even though the US and Russia, who have the most weapons in the thousands each, have been making efforts to get rid of the weapons, countries who don't are not patient and not happy with the process. They want more disarmament. So this is an issue that's not necessarily related to this particular administration. This is an issue that exists. Now, the question will come up, of course, is if we do not extend the START Treaty, which I'll talk about, then an indication that you, you are not taking the steps we have been taking for many years to reduce our weapons, okay? Um, so this is an issue uh, that has been around for a while is Article 6. Having said that, in 2017, a number of countries who do not have nuclear weapons decided, actually 2016, they decided that we need to make a change. Something has to happen. Article 6 is not being uh, implemented. Uh, we need to have a negotiation on disarmament of nuclear weapons. And the, uh, the obligation of Article 6 is for all countries, not just the nuclear weapon countries. So they decided that they're going to get together and do this under the UN. And so what they have done is agree to a treaty that basically says states agree not to develop, test, produce, acquire, possess, stockpile, or use or threaten to use nuclear weapons. Uh, and prohibit the deployment of nuclear weapons. So these are these are agreements that these countries sat down and uh, drafted an agreement to. Uh, right now, the treaty needs 50 countries for it to enter into force. They have about 47. So they are very close to entering the force. What's the problem with this treaty? It doesn't have a single country that possesses a nuclear weapon where a part of the negotiations have signed off on the agreement at all. So you can see what the big issue here. The big issue here is that you have a treaty with 57 states soon will create a treaty that enters into force and it does not have a single country that has a weapon. So this will be an issue that will come up when we have the review conference that they have every five years for this treaty it will come up. It was supposed to be this year, but the COVID-19 they didn't have it. It will be next year probably. And as you can imagine, that issue is going to be a main, a main issue of concern. And if we do not extend the START Treaty, which I'll talk about, that will also be an issue of concern. And that's one of the reasons why arms control and nonproliferation experts are hoping that the Trump administration can agree to the extension of the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty before it expires next year in February. 
Um, as I said, the biggest problem to that treaty that I just talked about is no nuclear weapon state supported it, no nuclear weapon state is a part of the negotiations, um, and none have signed the treaty. As I said, if any question comes up while I'm going through this, please shout out. Okay, what's the next treaty that's a challenge? Uh, Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. This is a treaty that I actually worked on. I was one of the two lawyers from the US that negotiated this treaty, which was signed in 19, I think it was 1996. Um, this treaty um, was open for signature in 96. President Clinton was the first leader to sign it because the US was such a strong proponent of this treaty and a strong push for this treaty. Um, and it bans all nuclear explosions because the assumption is that if you ban nuclear explosions, you won't develop a nuclear weapon, right? You're not gonna go and develop a weapon if you don't know what's gonna happen if you blow it up. Uh, one of the challenges in the treaty, and I think we knew this when we did it, is that certain countries have to ratify it for it to enter into force. This is very unusual. We don't usually do this in treaties, but for this treaty, we said there are certain countries that have to ratify it, including the United States which at the time we thought would, we would not be a problem, right? Um, now, the countries who have not ratified it are China, Egypt, Iran, Israel, um, uh, probably shouldn't have Iran there twice, and the United States have all signed the treaty, but have not ratified the treaty. And then you have India, North Korea, and Pakistan who have not signed it at all. So you can already see the challenge here. Um, the US has not ratified it, China says, or it has said in the past that they were ratified after we ratify it. And then you have a number of countries who have not even signed it. And the chances of, and the question is, would North Korea even sign the treaty? You know, will Iran sign the treaty considering our relationships with Iran right now? So you can already see that this is gonna be a treaty that's gonna be very challenged in terms of ever entering the force, at least in the near, at least in the near future. Um, now, the, the treaty itself is very detailed for those of you who, have, who know about it. It has uh, inspection regimes, it has an international monitoring system, which is doing great scientific work. Uh, there's these systems that are all over the world and they can detect any kind of test, any kind of explosion, whether it's in the atmosphere, underground, on the water, um, and it has been able to, and it exists, even though the treaty doesn't exist, it's around the world doing great things in terms of uh, science. Unfortunately, the treaty itself is not being entered in force. And so in 1999, the CT, uh, CTBT was voted against by the Senate. They were, they were concerned about certain parts of the international monitoring system, which don't exist anymore. Those problems have been, any problem they had has been resolved. Uh, President Obama had pushed for this early on, um, but I think there was a recognition that this Senate was just not going to do it. And then in 2018, President Trump uh, in the nuclear posture review stated that the U.S. will not seek ratification of the CTBT. So there you have a, a statement that it's not going to even be pursued. Um, so, which is unusual. Normally countries, if they sign a treaty and they're not going to ratify it, they just usually stay silent. But here we have said we're not going to ratify, but we still can take advantage of the international monitoring system. So for those who have the question about whether the US is going to ratify the CTBT, if there's another Trump administration, I think you have here that's probably not going to happen. Um, however, fortunately, the, the work is still going on with the monitoring systems and the countries who have signed the treaty still meet in Vienna, Austria on a regular basis to discuss uh, issues. So that's two. Let's talk about the Inter Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, which was signed by um, President Reagan. So um, this treaty was, was brought about as the Soviet Union reached nuclear parity with the US, as it said, as it says. Um, and then there was a recognition between Reagan and Gorbachev, a desire to do something about the number of um, missiles uh, in, in Europe. Um, so they agreed to eliminate all of the nuclear conventional ground loss ballistic missiles with a range of 500 to 5,500 kilometers. Now this was the first time that the two, the two countries agreed to reduce the nuclear arsenals and eliminate an entire category of nuclear weapons, which they have. 
you know, uh, 2,692 missiles and have ended, have, have been re eliminated as a result of this treaty. So this is a, this is considered a very successful treaty. It actually did what it was supposed to do. Our European allies were very happy with this. They felt more comfortable because of course they're closer to Russia than we are in terms of these, uh, these weapons. Concerns were. We actually yes. have a question uh, about these previous treaties you just mentioned. Um, okay. Colin's asking if the Biden administration has mentioned signing any of these treaties as a part of their uh, policy posture. Um, the well, I could, uh, when I get to it, yes, it's the Biden administration said they will extend the START treaty, which I will talk about. Um, it's very likely that Biden will push for the CTBT. Uh, treaty, particularly since uh, President Obama was in favor of it, he was in favor of it. As I said, uh, they had to take a step back when it was recognized that that was not going to be happening. Um, so on those two, yes, on the non-proliferation treaty, and on the um, well, we're a part of that one. But on the TPNW, the the other treaty that no nuclear weapon state is a part of, I am not sure if we would. I'm not sure if we would sign that because I think the U the U.S. The U.S. pushback on Article Six of the NPT has been that we have been reducing our weapons and disarming um, with Russia, which are the two countries that have the most nuclear weapons. Okay, we have in the thousands; everyone else is in hundreds or less. Um, and so the so that has been the process of disarmament has been this gradual disarmament. Okay, and so. It's unlikely that the U.S. would just now sign a treaty uh, uh, saying that we're going to completely disarm because there, it's unlikely anyone's going to disarm like immediately. It's just not going to happen because it's not the kind of geopolitical situation for that. But the U.S. and Russia have both gone down a lot, quite a bit of numbers uh, in their possession and deployments. And the way that we have been doing this has been with these treaties, which goes back to start which I'll talk to in a second, because we have been doing these treaties with INF and START, and a number of these treaties with the Soviet Union and then Russia to actually reduce our weapons. And so START is the last one that's left, because we got, because as I'll say, tell you, we got out of the INF treaty. So the only one we're still in is START, um, which helps to understand why that treaty is so important. We actually have a follow-up question from Grace, um, who wants to know what the Senate and the current administration's reasoning is for not wanting to ratify the CTBT treaty. Um, the Senate, as I understand it, they, they still have concerns about the international monitoring system. I am not sure that's really it, but that's one of the reasons why they're saying uh, the Trump administration, there's been some, there's been some um, uh, statements about possibly testing again. And we know that there are people who have the president's ear who are interested in starting the test. We don't need to test. Uh, we are at a point, we have something called the Stockpile Stewardship Program, which we started really because of the CTBT, where we were able to say, we don't need to test to ensure our weapons are still are still good weapons. We can we can use them if we need to. Um, so we don't need to test. But there is um, there have been uh, discussions about possibly testing again, which would probably be which obviously would be a really bad thing. Um, so that may be a little bit why the Trump administration is against it. Keep in mind, the treaty has been given to the Senate for ratification. So in a sense, it's really in the Senate's hand to decide. It's already been signed off by the president. Um, so when President Clinton signed it, it's been signed off. And then we got it ready for the Senate ratification. We gave it to the Senate and now the Senate has to act on it. So in many ways, it's really the Senate's decision about what to do at this point. Um, the president can certainly push on him, but it's really in their hands about what they're gonna do but they have shown no real interest. And in addition, the administrations have always had other things uh, that they've had to immediately push. Um, and so, so New START came along because the other START was coming to an end. So they had to, they had to do that more importantly, for example. Any other questions? 
I think that covers those at this time. Okay, great. So, um, as I'm sure you know where I was headed on this one, <laughs> um, we withdrew from the INF treaty. There were so there were certainly concerns between us and Russia about INF. So I, I'm not going to say that Russia was in total compliance. There were concerns that they were they were uh, starting to develop and test weapon uh, missiles that were not compliant to the INF treaty. And so there was back and forth with Russia for you know a few years because of that. So there were valid concerns. The problem is that there was not a there was not a real belief by many outside the U.S. who were poor who like the treaty, like our European partners, um, or by the arms control community that it was uh, it was ready for one to withdraw from. You know, because of its success, because of what it achieved, and the fact that if you get rid of the treaty, then you can just start doing the countries can start, Russia can start, and the U.S. can start all over again you know, or other countries. So when you don't have a treaty, you have nothing to stop a country from doing it. So it opens up the possibility for more arms. It opens up the possibilities for another arms race. So the idea was it was better to hold on to the treaty and try to figure out how to deal with the issues rather than withdraw. Okay, so we are not a part of that anymore. So that treaty's gone, okay? I see a question, is there a and a I'll, I'll wait for you to ask the question, so I won't worry about it. Yes, uh, we just got a new question. Um, what measures are put in place to ensure that member countries actually keep up their end of the deal? Do other members have surveillance over them, or does everyone just kind of hope for the best? Um, in these kind of treaties, you just you you have verification mechanisms, so you can. There are a couple things that you do. You you have verification mechanisms where you do inspections. So countries inspect each other for most of these treaties, except the BWC, unfortunately. These treaties usually have inspection provisions. So you can expect what each other's doing. You have what they call national technical means. So you have satellites, you can check and see what countries are doing. And then you have the actual forums that are established. Each one of these treaties establish a way in which countries can meet together on a regular basis. They have review conferences. Uh, countries can just decide they wanna meet together. Um, you know, there's, so there's there's mechanisms I put into this to keep countries build confidence that they're doing the right thing. And then when there's a dispute, all the treaties also have uh, they all set up these these groups, you know, these uh, these subgroups within the, the the countries to actually discuss compliance issues. So um, there's mechanisms I put into the treaty so that they can resolve their own concerns. And normally, for the most part. Countries don't get into these big arms control treaties unless they're ready to do it. And times and things change, you know. And so what you use is you use the possibility of adaptation to adapt treaties to, to whatever changes happen. And that's really the sense that you go into. You go into it with the idea that this is a treaty that stays unless there's an ex expiration date, at which time we will sit together and decide to extend it. That's the normal thinking. You know, but there's usually a thinking that it's going to stay. Something's going to say we given up. We have given up major weapons for our security. We didn't do that lightly, and we usually did it after years of negotiations. So we're not just going to give it up. We're going to try to maintain it. Which is another reason why you've heard so much uproar by the fact that we have gotten out of treaties because you just you just don't usually do that. You know, president by president usually sticks with the treaty. They may say we want to make adjustments to it. But you, these arms control treaties, you just don't usually just jump out because of the time and energy and the sacrifices that have gone into, into their negotiations. Okay, so, so we've, we see where we are with those treaties. Now we have the new Strategic Arm Reduction Treaty, which was signed in 2011. There, were, there, were, there was a START one, there was a START two treaty. This is the treaty that came after START three. These are, this is when it came after a number of other treaties which we were reducing our, our, our nuclear arsenal. So this was agreed to in, in 2011. Um, and numbers here, I'm not going to go through all of them, but it says just how many uh, in a, a ICBMs a country can have, how many can be deployed, all of these issues. I mean, without getting into all the detail, the most important thing to take away is that we agree with Russia on limits for uh, ballistic missiles, deployed missiles, all these things. And this was continuing the 
effort that we start back in start one to continue to have these reduction in forces, okay? This process of disarmament that I talked about in the non-proliferation article six, this is what's continuing to do that, okay? And the idea is that the treaty would expire in 2021, February next year, but before that, Russia and United States would sit down and, and think about what they would do to go even further in the reductions. You know, so there wasn't really a thinking that it was actually going to expire. It was always set up that it would it, it could extend without going back to the Senate. You don't have to go back to the Senate for re, to, to ratify it again. You just, you know, just keep it going. Um, just to say the two sit down and say, okay, we're going to continue this. Let's think about what we can do next. Um, so unfortunately, there has been like almost two years of back and forth to try to see how we can extend this treaty. Um, and it has not been uh, successful. And we have, and to be honest with you, without being partisan, it really has been the U.S. fault. Because the U.S. has, the Russia has been coming back to U.S. several times uh, saying we want to extend the treaty. Uh, how can we extend the treaty? And we have continually said we don't, we, we, we have put up some obstacles. Um, one of them has been we want to include China in the negotiation. Um, and in a recent discussion, two, I think maybe two or three weeks ago, um, Russia said we will extend New START without any preconditions. Let's just go and have a discussion. Um, and, then, and then the United States came back and said, no, we want to limit all types of nuclear warheads. We want to have China, uh, which is a problem because China doesn't want to be part of this treaty. So we have been saying to Russia, we cannot extend it unless China jumps in. And China said, we don't want to be a part of it. And Russia has said, we're not going to try to twist China's arm to be a part of this. This is a bilateral treaty. It's been bilateral for many years. You know, through all the START treaties we've had, it's always been bilateral. Let's just keep this bilateral. Uh, and then some people say, well, you can always have China in a different agreement. So we've been holding it up for China. And then uh, we also said in, in a recent statement um, that we will raise the price for new START extension after November. I don't know what that means, whatever this new price is. But anyway, that's what we said back to Russia, kind of like a threat. Um, and then um, the problem is that if we don't have extension, then we lose all opportunity to have inspections. Right now, we're not only are we reducing the weapons, but we're actually we can inspect each other's territory and make sure that we're we're abiding by the treaty. So you won't have any inspections. You won't have a forum for discussion. You would have ended. This is the last treaty that we have with Russia on these issues. So if we don't do this one, we have nothing after all these years. Um, we lose a chance for continuing to reduce, um, and because we're losing it for a reason that's doesn't really make a lot of sense right now, which is to bring in China. We can always talk to China, but we shouldn't, at least my view, we shouldn't necessarily end this treaty because we're trying to bring in China. So that's that. So that's where we are with this. Um, it's not moving forward, you know, um, and just, you know, and just two days ago, or maybe just three days ago, Russia said, we'll do a temporary extension while the two of us agree on an official extension. And the administration, U.S. administration, didn't want that either. So that's where we are with that. So as you can see, as you can see, as I go through this, you see why there's a lot of concern by the arms control community about what's going to be happening in the future on nuclear weapons issues. Um, and as I said before, this goes back to the non-proliferation treaty, uh, where you know Article Six, when we have a review conference, if we haven't extended the treaty, not only are they going to be countries are going to be angry because we didn't sign up to the 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 tp and w treaty but we also haven't extended the start treaty so keep that in mind so we're almost done with our issues <laughs> so the nuclear posture review what are we doing here so we just uh, two things to keep in mind we've done to this uh we've decided to expand the use of nuclear weapons okay so in the past few years, the U.S. has been taking steps to um, reduce the, op the times that we would actually use a nuclear weapon. So, for example, in 2010, we said um, we, will, we will 
we strengthen our pledge of non-use against nuclear non-nuclear weapon states that are in good standing with their non-proliferation obligations even in the unlikely event that one of those states attacks the U.S. and its allies with chemical biological weapons. So essentially, this is what we're doing. We're actually trying to reduce the opportunities or, or to announce to countries that if you're in good standing with non-proliferation, which means you're not developing nuclear weapons, it's likely we will not attack you, okay? Um, and so that's a, that's a positive thing in terms of countries thinking that they're not gonna be attacked by a nuclear weapon, which most countries don't wanna feel that's gonna be the case. Um, so um, we also said in 2010 that it used a nuclear weapon but only in an extreme circumstance, only to, to, to defend the vital interests of the United States. Um, so we're trying to make the objective of making deterrence of nuclear attack and our allies the sole purpose of a nuclear weapon. We're trying to say, we're not going to attack you with a nuclear weapon unless you attack us with a nuclear weapon. That's kind of the direction it was going. However, in 2018, we've kind of took some steps back on that with the 2018 NPR, where we said we included, um, we can use a nuclear weapon um, for significant non-nuclear strategic attacks against infrastructure, nuclear forces, command and control. These are all things that were not in the earlier statement. We did not include attacks on command and control. Um, and it also makes references to the use of a nuclear weapon in case there's a chemical or biological attack or large conventional aggression or a cyber attack. So we've added all of these conditions where we can actually use a nuclear weapon. So what we've done is we've gone backwards. We were going in a way in the past few years to a place where we're not going to use them. And so we've opened up this other door. The other thing we've done is we said we're going to be looking at new types of nuclear weapons. So we're going to be looking at smaller weapons, these tactical nuclear weapons that are not the big weapons, but they're tactical to give us more options for how we want to use nuclear weapons. And we're also going to be putting them on different types of, of, of uh, platforms. So we're putting low yield nuclear, these low yield nuclear weapons on submarine launch ballistic missiles um, and on sea launch cruise missiles. So we've essentially not only added new types of nuclear weapons, these tactical weapons, we've extended, expanded where we might want to put them. Um, so this has created a whole source of concerns, as you might imagine. Um, not only that, but it also is going to cost a lot of money. So, uh, and we are already spending a lot of money on modernizing our nuclear weapons, trillions of dollars to do that. To do this, to create all these tactical nuclear weapons, you're adding a lot more money. So not, are you, not only are you adding weapons that is very questionable whether we need them, not only adding to all more platforms, but we're also increasing how much money, which I don't think we can afford. Okay, so it's not getting any better, guys. <laughs> So then we have the Open Skies Treaty, another treaty that I worked on, okay? This is a treaty that is um, really a confidence building measure where treaty, where treaty parties can overfly each other and take photos as a confidence building measure to ensure that countries are not violating treaty, right? Um, I could talk a lot more about this later, but for purposes of now, I won't. And just to say that another, this is another treaty that US withdrew from. Um, our European allies are very happy with the treaty. It was great for them. Of course, the US and Russia have great natural technical means. We always did. We could always use our satellites for a lot of times, but we did this really for our partners who didn't have the satellites that we have, okay? And so it's been used. It's been used, for example, when Russia went into Ukraine, Ukraine asked us if they could help us with overflights over Russia. So it's been very helpful. Um, the US withdrew. Um, and our partners were not very happy about that. Um, so this is another case where we withdrew from uh, a treaty that our allies are very happy with. Uh, Germany was very unhappy with it. So was France. I mean, so you had our allies who have been with us on this treaty since it was established in 1992, um, questioning why did we get out of a treaty? Now, there was a concern 
to be honest, it was a concern because Russia was not letting us go over some parts of territories that we wanted to go to, for example, Kaliningrad. Um, however, once again, the question became, was that worth getting out of the, getting out of the treaty? And was that advantageous? So that's another treaty that's gone. And we haven't even gotten a JCPOA yet. So I'm going to go through this quickly because I know you've been looking at a lot of slides, but I think it gives you an idea of where we're headed with all of this. So the JCPOA, as you know, was with us, you, with all these countries in Iran, uh, China, France, Russia, UK, Germany, European Union. Um, and it was very successful in cutting down the possibility of Iran developing a nuclear weapon. And that's why we were doing it. Because as you might remember, it was a lot of back and forth with us in Iran about whether they were developing a nuclear weapon. Iran was saying they weren't, we were saying they were. Our intelligence was telling us that they were, they were saying they weren't. And so after months of all of this, we decided that we needed to do something because Iran was only one year away from developing a nuclear weapon. So we had to do something quickly. And so what the agreement did is it basically limited, without going into detail, it basically limited how much effort, how much Iran could do both through uranium and plutonium, the two ways to develop a nuclear weapon that they could actually use to develop a nuclear weapon. Um, and uh, they had a lot, they were, they had a lot that they could use to do it, but they were limited in many ways in what they could do. Um, and I won't go into detail, but I will say that their uranium stockpile that they had was reduced by 98% from where they were when they started before the JCPOA. They have re re drastically reduced the number of centrifuges which you need for developing uh, weapons um, and shipped tons of uranium out to Russia. Um, they had... Um, they had, they had one of the most important things was that the International Atomic Energy Agency was able to put people on the ground and had more intrusive, they were more intrusive in Iran they had been in any other country. That's probably one of the best parts about the agreement. Um, sanctions were lifted, but sanctions could be automatically reimposed if Iran were starting to do something bad. You had US intelligence, you had the IAEA on the ground, you had the European intelligence, um, you had Russia uh, looking around, you had China looking around. Um, so anything that Iran could have been doing would have been detected by somebody. And the US intelligence, the IAEA, and everybody was on the ground in the air satellites. There was no indication that Iran was doing anything to violate the treaty. Um, there were other provisions of the treaty that was going to help build confidence. Uh, so not just the hard stuff, but the soft stuff uh, between the countries. The IAEA noted that since it started, there was no evidence of Iran violating the treaty. Um, that the IAEA reporting that Iran was implementing its nuclear related commitments in according with the contract. Um, however, as all of you know, um, President Trump had to keep certifying the treaty. And it got to a point where he was indicating that he was going to withdraw um, from the agreement. Uh, I shouldn't say treaty is more of an agreement. So we did. And we pulled out in May of 2018. The other countries stayed. They've been trying to make it work. It's been very challenging. We went back and we, in, we put the sanctions back in. So basically the question now is, and of course, COVID came along and, and kind of put an end to a lot of the discussions. But essentially, it's another treaty that we withdrew from. North Korea, uh, very quickly, another situation that's not positive. We've had a number of summits. Um, President Trump went over to Korea. He stepped over the demilitarization zone. There were a lot of photo ops, a lot of opportunities for photo ops. There was some hope that we would get some place in terms of North, North Korea getting rid of its nuclear weapons. North Korea had stopped testing for a while. Um, so there was, even for the arms control community that did not think that it was going to be successful based on our understanding of how these things work, we were hopeful as well. Um, needless to say, um, after the number of summits that happened, uh, we are now at a point where nothing is really going on. Um, and uh, Kim Jong-un had said at the end of last year, that he was hoping that something would happen between the two countries 
because he had said, you know, he had warned the U.S. not to ignore the deadline at the end of the year to specify what will happen and when they will talk again. So that didn't happen. And so now we're back to where we were before. Uh, we're at the beginning of this year. Kim Jong-un said his country was no longer bound by a self-imposed moratorium on nuclear missile testing. Um, and so that's kind of where that is. So that's where we are in the nuclear world. Um, chemical weapons, I'm not gonna go through this much, but just to say that the biggest challenge for chemical weapons is that there are a number of countries who have not, um, have not uh, implemented legislation. So it's very difficult to deal with, um, with non-state actors. We know that it was used in Syria, so it's not like it can't be used anymore. We know that Russia used use it against uh, a Russian spy. I mean, they, a former Russian spy, there have been uses of it. Um, so this is still an issue, not a huge issue, I don't think, in terms of use. Unfortunately, if countries do or now state actors get their hands on it, it can be a big problem. Um, in the bio side, the only thing I will say here is that unfortunately, the Biological Weapons Convention does not have a verification regime, um, really because the US pulled out of that during the Bush administration, we decided not to continue to have a verification regime. It's the only one that doesn't have one. We've been very lucky that nothing's happened in terms of biological weapons. However, there are now concerns and thoughts about what we're gonna do because of COVID-19, because all evidence is that it was not intentional, that it was a natural occurring disease, but it does raise a question about what do we do in terms of biosecurity and biopathogens. And so after all of that, um, I think I've given you a very good lay of the land to help you understand why we have the questions we have today. And so people have asked, what would change if we have a uh, Biden administration? I think uh, from what you've seen from everything that if the Trump administration stays, that more than likely things will probably continue. There's, no, there's nothing to indicate that things will change drastically on any of the treaties I mentioned. Um, that they would probably be the status quo, maybe worse, but probably the status quo at a minimum. Um, the question of Biden, Biden has said that he will extend the START Treaty. CTPT, I think, has a very good possibility of being pushed. Um, we would probably re-engage, I would pretty sure we will re-engage our allies. Um, both, uh, we will re-engage multilateral organizations like the World Health Organization, NATO, uh, then hopefully the U.S. will uh, take a much more of a, a global leadership role as we have in the past. So um, that's it. That's where we are. I, it's, not a great, it's not a great way to end <laughs> this presentation, but I did want to just make it very clear why we are where we are on these issues and uh, happy to answer any, any questions that uh, have not been asked already. Thank you so much, Ambassador Jenkins. That was fantastic. And yes, we'd love we'd love any questions. Um, so if you if anyone who'd like to answer a question can pop it into the chat. Um, I'd like to open the floor just with a question for you. Um, something that you mentioned uh, briefly in the beginning of your talk, and then just at the end with the Biological Weapons Convention. Um, you talked a little bit about how the Bush administration decided to pull out of of uh, discussions for a verification um, verification or monitoring body for the treaty. And there was some, uh, during the 2000s, there was some speculation that maybe an Obama administration would walk back on that policy and rejoin the table uh, to talk about an implement, implementation body, uh, but they didn't. And that was when you were also, also uh, a part of the administration and working with these issues. I was wondering if you could give us some insight into the Obama administration's um, decision to not continue those negotiations. And also if you could uh, talk about how you think COVID will impact the next review conference for the BWC. Um, a couple of responses. Um, the very initial conversations about the BWC, the decisions, I wasn't yet in the government. I think I was still going through the processes. <laughs> um, and I was probably a lot more focused on the nuclear, so I don't have all the answers. Well, I'll say a couple of things. One of the reasons why we did not pursue the verification regime in the Biological Weapons Convention is because we had a strong bio, 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 biology community, scientists, that did not want the treaty verification. 
uh, when we did the Chemical Weapons Convention, one of the reasons why we were able to agree to such an intrusive verification regime is because we had the Chemical Manufacturers Association who were working with us. And they were part of the good negotiations. They were integrated into the negotiations. So they were, I guess you could say, on board with those provisions. We never got that with the Biological uh, Association. The, bio, the scientists never, they, I think they saw what happened with the CWC and they said, we're not doing that. Um, and there's such a, and because the biological, it's all due use, it's all due use. You know, it's not like nuclear weapons where you have to have highly rich uranium or plutonium to build a nuclear weapon. If you don't, it, you have no reason to have those unless you're gonna build a nuclear weapon. Chemical and even more so biological is all due use. So, you know, they were worried about proprietary issues. They didn't want scientists, I mean, they didn't want inspectors coming into their labs to say, we want to verify that they're, you're not going to build a biological weapon because they could be there working on the next vaccine, you know, uh, and they didn't want people coming in and they have proprietary information. So they, they were very much against it. Um, I don't believe no one, that, that that would have gone away during the Obama administration. Um, so what we did instead was have to start this whole of government approach about how we look at infectious disease, um, bringing in the prevent, detect, and respond, and pulling them all together, and to try to strengthen the entire regime that way. Um, and what was the second part? Um, I was wondering if you could speak to how you think that the COVID pandemic will change um, or impact the review conference coming up in 2021. Right. Um, there yeah, um, I guess there's, you know, there's two ways of looking at it. We have this, I, you mentioned the global health security agenda, which is something that, that uh, I worked on. And a lot of that has incorporated biosecurity because like I said, it's prevent, detect and response. So the prevent side includes biosecurity. So there's been a lot of work that countries have been do doing on the, on the biosecurity side, part of infectious disease. However, in addition to that, you have the Biological Weapon Convention, as you said, which focuses a lot on bio, on bioweapons and biosecurity is obviously a part of that. Um, so there will be questions, I believe, at the, at the convention on the relationship between COVID and biological weapons. And um, not that there is a direct connection, because as I said, there's no evidence right now that COVID-19 was an intentional disease. It was accidental. Um, I'm sorry, natural from, from our understanding. Um, but it does raise questions about it, the, what does that mean in terms of what we need to be thinking about in terms of biosecurity? You know, things need to be more concerned now, now that, you know, people can see the damage that can be done by a, a biological, by an infectious disease, which could have been a biological weapon, you know? And so I think it will definitely raise People want to. People will look at that and see. We have to ask what we learn from that. Thank you. Our next question is from Matthew. A new Biden administration has said it would pursue a simple five-year extension to New Start. With the freeing of manpower and resources this would entail, what nuclear non-proliferation issue should a Biden administration instead focus on first and foremost? Um, well, the, well, first of all, it'll be continuing to make sure the uh, start happens because just agreeing to it means a simple extension is great, but then you have to actually have the negotiations about what does the next, what does the extension mean? Because we've already done everything we needed to do under start, under new start. That's already been the numbers that we needed to reduce. We have been, have, have happened. So you have to have more negotiations about what are the numbers we're going to go reduce to now. So that's going to be its own thing. Um, I'm, pr I'm sure that there's going to be um, questions about the TPNW and what, if anything, we should do about that. I think some people want to stay away from it, um, but, um, you know, there may be some who want to think about, is there, is there a middle ground for how we deal with the fact that we haven't signed it? Um, but like I said, there may be nothing because people will say we're doing what we need to do by disarming slowly. Um, there's still issues of nuclear security that I worked on that, you know, may be some remnants of what we need to do in nuclear security um, that could be uh, answered. And then we have the NPT conference coming up and, and getting ready for that will also uh, uh, concern us. And finally, China. I mean, there may be things that we need to do with China. Maybe, maybe START is not the right 
platform and the right thing to do. But there are things that we could be talking about with them regarding new types of technology that they may be in, in doing in terms of uh, the, their existing nuclear weapons. So I think that there's certainly uh, an opportunity for conversation. And there's always North Korea. <laughs> and JCPOA. <laughs> Our next question is from Jay, uh, and it's about your career more broadly. Um, how did you get involved in this field, and what was your path to the position you held under the Obama administration? Um, I got into this field totally by accident, and um, it's because I was a fellow, and I was at the Pentagon working uh, in the International Law Office because uh, through my JD. I had arrived there under the Presidential Management Fellowship Program, if any of you don't know about the PMI, I mean the PMF program, uh, Presidential Management Program, please find out because it's a great way to get into the government. Um, and while I was on one of the rotations that you're allowed with that program, I went to a meeting and they were talking about strategic weapons. And I just decided at that moment that was something I really wanted to do. And that was really my entry into it. I had no idea, I didn't even think about those issues for that meeting. Um, which I guess is a lesson in keeping your eyes open about things that you might be interested in, you know, keeping your options open. Um, and leading to the Obama administration, I think it's just accumulation of all the work that I've done. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's quite a few paths that I've, I've uh, meandered between that first meeting I went to on these issues and where I ended up at the Ford Foundation in 2000, uh, 2005, then being asked in 2009 to join. Um, so really just being in the field from, for several years, um, you know, being in a position where I knew a lot of people because of the work that I did both in the government and at the Ford Foundation where I funded organizations to do this type of work and operation. I would say probably that, those things. Our next question is about your organization. Can you talk more about your work at Women of Color Advancing Peace and Security and why you believe we need greater representation of women and people of color in the international security and arms control fields? Uh, well, thank you for the question. Uh, the organization I established in 2017, please go to wcaps.org. We have a brand new website, you can check it out. Um, and we, uh, and you can join us as a member, it's open to everybody. Um, I started it mainly because Yes, we need to have more voices on issues of peace and security, including for including arms control, because the lack of peace and security affect people of color, uh, and particularly women, predominantly. You know, if you look at COVID nineteen, it's just an example of how no matter what the issue is, whether it's chemical weapon use in Syria or climate change or COVID nineteen around the world, and you see who's who's affected in America. Um, you know, we are, you know, people of color are predominantly uh, impacted and women as a rule are predominantly impacted because of, because of the role that we play in society and in our families. And yet, uh, we are not at the tables. We are not the ones that determining policy. I can say that because I've been at a lot of these tables where I was the only one or one of two or max one of three, <laughs> if we were lucky. And yet these decisions affect us. And so really, I started it for that reason. There are several reasons why I started it, but that's really the biggest reason. And to also to instill a, a pipeline of, of people who can be in these fields. Um, and it's important that we are represented because even when we think we're not impacted by these decisions, we are. Um, and even if we think that, um, you know, and we have to, you know, that we are, and we have to make sure that decisions that are made are, are that our interests are, are, are kept in mind. I mean, when you think about all the nuclear testing that we've done earlier in, in, the, in the 50s and 60s and even 70s, it was done in a lot of areas where indigenous people live and they're still suffering from that. You know, so if you're not at the table, you're not there to change minds, you're not there to raise your hand and say, no, nope, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of group think, you know, and everyone who's in the room think that they're all thinking the right thing. Um, so for a lot of these reasons, I established it. Our next question is about your career as well. Could you speak a little bit about your role as overseeing the cooperative threat reduction programs at the US Department of State? How have you seen the mission of that agency and of the Bureau of International Security and Nonproliferation change during the Trump administration? How does this change in mission affect international security? A couple of parts. Yeah, um, yeah that, 
when during the um, the time I was in government, it was a great time to be there for these issues because if you may recall, the very first speech that President Obama did in um, in Prague was about nuclear weapons and about you know the reduction of nuclear weapons, the importance of securing nuclear material that could be used to make a nuclear weapon to make sure terrorists will get their hands on them. Um, and I know a lot of the people who were who brought who were brought in the government. Uh, and they're focused on these issues. So it was a great time to be there because it was an important issue for the president, which means it's an important issue for the rest of the government. There were a lot of, uh, well, no, a lot is saying too much, but there were a significant number of women who were brought in at the time, uh, a lot through uh, Secretary Clinton, uh, who brought in women uh, in these hard security fields. Um, and, and the work, and it was a good time to be there doing this work. Um, I think that right now with the reduction, um, and of course CTR threat reduction program um, has been a very important part of the work that we have done uh, with Russia right after the Soviet Union fell apart and uh, reducing uh, and securing chemical, biological, nuclear weapons um, and missiles and getting rid of them with, with, with Russia. Um, and now around the world, because now CTR is around the world as well. Uh, for now, I think, you know, the work continues. Uh, it's a lot more low key right now because it's not the most important thing uh, of the administration. Um, um, Senator Luger has passed on. Uh, and so, you know, he was the real champion left uh, in the Senate before he left uh, on these issues. He, he was one there when I, when I got the, when I was um, being confirmed, he was there for that. So the work continues, the work continues. I mean, the, you know, it, it will, cause it's very bipartisan. I mean, the issue of making sure that there's non-state actors to develop a chemical bond a nuclear weapon, nobody wants that, you know? And, um, and it was always bipartisan. So the work continues. It's just a little more low key right now. We've got a few more questions at this time. Lindsay or Carolyn, feel free to cut us off when, when you need to. Um, but our next question is about a new, uh, a, a potential change in administration as well. Um, will it be difficult for the potential Biden administration to mend our relationship with the countries we have hurt by pulling out of these treaties and agreements? Um, I, think that, I think the Biden, if we have a Biden uh, administration, I think it will not be hard at all to get back into these agreements because you know we can always go I mean we said we're leaving the WHO it's not official yet we can always go back I mean you know we can I mean none of these things are in stone and as a and as the head of state the head of state can just you know we can can say the U.S. will rejoin you know um so that possibility is always out there even if we even for the Trump administration we withdraw from the WHO for example the next administration could always go back in Our next question is from Lillian. Um, she wants to thank you for your work and your time here today. Um, also, if you could give one piece of advice to a fledgling progressive organization in the field of international security uh, comprised predominantly of women of color, what would it be? Um, well, thanks, thanks Lillian for listening to uh, and sticking with me with all my PowerPoint slides, <laughs> which I hope wasn't too difficult. Um, I would say to stick with it. I mean, you know, when I started, when I started my organization, I, I didn't know if it was going to work because there really weren't, there wasn't an organization like mine out there with women of color, looking at peace and security, hard security, soft security, looking at all the different areas. And so, you know, there are many times, I mean, when I started, I didn't, I didn't know if it was going to work. I mean, I, I was, let's just see what happens. I didn't even seek funding or anything. I just kind of did things I could on reduced funding because I didn't know if people would be interested. And so I was very happy to find out that there was an interest in, in this issue. And, you know, and, and that has actually helped, helped to spawn a number of other organizations who are looking at, you know, different groups in foreign policy and, and, and national security and having a much more of a say. So it's been great to see that, um, but I would say, you know, stick with it, you know. Um, you know, it, it, anything, you know, that you're trying to do that's, that's, that's fledgling, the only way it's going to get stronger is to keep working at it. 
Ambassador Jenkins, we have one more question if you have have the time for just one more. Um, looking forward at the interface between terrorism, insurgency and NBC, we've already seen the impact of black market materials and technology, as well as commercially available materials and technology, including cybersecurity. What processes are being designed for inclusion into future treaty processes over non-governmental facets of NBC security? Okay, say that part again, because I'm not sure I got the whole thing. Sorry about that. What okay. processes are being designed for inclusion into future treaty processes over non-governmental facets of NBC security? I'm not sure I understand what is, what it was meant by non-governmental facets of in. I mean, just different types of technologies. I believe so. I believe that's what. They think. Yeah. Um, I think it's talking about non-state actors uh, as opposed to simply state actors and and the proliferation of technology, um, that kind of thing. Yeah, there's something. There's something that, if, if I understand the question, there's something called the UN Security Council Resolution 1540, and this is not a traditional treaty or a traditional convention in the sense that. You know, it was signed and then ratified. This was this was um, adopted by the UN Security Council under Chapter Seven. And as you know, when something is adopted under Chapter Seven, it becomes it automatically is international law. So it doesn't have to be ratified. It's automatically and and this Security Council resolution actually is focused on non-state actors and uh, the type of technology that they could be. Uh, transferring uh, uh, through uh, and instigate and putting in place export controls uh, to help prevent the transfer of technologies um, so that Nazi actors can build and uh, nu uh, nuclear, chemical, biological weapons. And it also focuses on um, financial transactions, so terrorist financing, which is one of the first times that's been highlighted in a in a convention or a Security Council resolution. So there is something that exists out there. It reinforces the three treaties by saying countries have to implement legislation to abide by nuclear, the NPT, the Chemical Weapons Convention and the Biological Weapons Convention. It promotes export controls and it also promotes um, efforts to prevent financial transaction, terrorist financing. Well, thank you very much, uh, Madam Ambassador for that uh, fascinating presentation that brings us up to speed on a wide range of issues that are uh, that I, I worry are being neglected. You know, and we were talking before the session started a little bit about the idea of failure of imagination. I, I just wonder if we haven't lost our sense of urgency about the power of these weapons and and the need for us collectively to to work together on them. But anyway, and and also your your uh, comments on your career and uh, and your your new organization. So we just want to wish you the best of luck with that, and and let us know how we can help. Um, we try to do our best on some of those issues here uh, in, in the various programs at, at the University of Texas. And we're glad to have you. And I'm so glad that um, Marini wanted to invite you. And uh, Marini, thank you so much for, for your monitoring the questions and, and taking care of that today. Good job on that. So Madam Ambassador, thank you so much. And with that, I think we'll conclude our session here. Thank you. Thank you.